Israel is set to go ahead with a ground invasion of Rafah in the south of Gaza. That's despite urgings, including from the Australian Prime Minister and, let's be frank, more importantly, from the US President as well. Joining me live is Greg Sharon, foreign editor at The Australian. Greg, I thought it was noteworthy as well. We've even had Donald Trump uh, recently in an interview um, tell, talk directly to um, Israel media saying you're losing support for this. The leadership in Israel, the um, Netanyahu, must be weighing up how to sort of achieve what he wants to here. Yeah, well, I think it's obvious they're suffering a lot of international uh, damage. I think most of it very unfairly. But uh, my Israeli friends tell me that they're looking at some much more limited operation in Rafah than they've undertaken elsewhere in Gaza. And you saw that they've withdrawn the vast majority of their troops from Gaza. And, of course, if Hamas would release even 40 prisoners, they could have a, at least a six-week ceasefire tomorrow. So um, I think, Tom, it's a bit absurd for the whole international community to be putting pressure on Israel, whereas Ga Hamas could stop this conflict and end all the suffering for everybody tomorrow by releasing all the hostages and um, admitting that their murderous, savage, barbaric terrorism uh, was, was, was wrong. As to what will happen, just to sort of flesh out what you were saying there, though, you believe it'll be a smaller scale uh, ground invasion if they can take out whatever targets that are in there. Would that then possibly be the end of, of the ground invasion, if you like, of Israel into Gaza? Would it be a withdrawal at that point? Or would it sort of be still uh, troops there in some way until there's a, a genuine ceasefire or truce achieved? Well, I don't think there's going to be a permanent withdrawal uh, under any circumstances, even with a ceasefire. Uh, Israel is going to keep some troops in Gaza, uh, for sure, because they're not going to let what happened on October 7 happen again. Um, there are a lot of different ways they could approach Rafa. They might do it sector by sector. Uh, they might be able to do um, a less intense operation. Um, it depends what they do to evacuate sectors of the civilian population, or this might all be a bit of a bluff by Netanyahu, which doesn't come into being if there is a ceasefire. Um, it is intensely fluid and intensely unpredictable at the moment. The killing of the, the seven aid workers was the thing that hurt Israel the most about this is we found out more information about this probably than a lot of other strikes, if you like. And when previously we were told, you know, this is a very professional uh, military force, if you like, and we've got multiple checks and balances that, yes, Israel said that they failed on this occasion, but it seems to be a pretty catastrophic failure and it does draw into question, you know, how well run this system actually is on making sure legitimate targets are hit. Yeah, I don't really agree with you there, Tom. I mean, in every uh, military engagement which Australia has been involved of any consequence, our soldiers have tragically killed civilians. Um, there's very extensive uh, export, expert evidence that Israel has produced a much lower ratio of civilian casualties in the Gaza operation than uh, other forces typically have, certainly a much lower civilian ratio than the operation we were involved in in Fallujah or the Allied operation in Mosul. Hamas has decided to wage war amid civilians. It's put its tunnels under civilian buildings, hospitals, schools and so on, so Israel is faced with this conundrum. Either it does nothing and allows Hamas to continue to murder, rape and mutilate its people more or less at will, or it goes in and destroys Hamas militarily. Now, you can't destroy Hamas militarily in Gaza without waging war in the civilian areas. And tragically, in any uh, uh, military contest of this kind, you're going to get civilian casualties. I think the government's appointment of Mark Binskin is an even worse appointment than the David Johnston as the chief of the defence force because it's it's purely uh, symbolic performative politics. I mean, any liaison role we need could be carried out by our ambassador in Israel. Uh, Binskin has no role at all. We would never allow foreign military to get involved in our internal investigations. And also Binskin will do what uniformed soldiers always do, do what the government tells him. So if the government tells him to produce a critical report, that's what he'll produce. If he tells him to produce a you know, a status quo report, that's what he'll 
produced. But I mean, this government makes very bad military appointments. I think they've made a very bad appointment today. David Johnston is the status quo candidate to be the chief of the defence force. And the government tells us there's a tremendous malaise in the defence culture. And then it promotes, appoints, honours and, uh, you know, glorifies everybody who's presided over the terrible dysfunction of the last uh, the last 10 years in procurement, equipment, capability, recruitment and everything else. So it's interesting because when Richard Miles is quite critical of the, as you say, the culture, and he, he was quite critical, it was un, unusual to hear, I suppose, the, the background that went out straight afterwards was it was not the top level, but people sort of just below that. So if that's the case, is it fair enough to promote David Johnston if he, um, you know, was was not part of the problem, but it's people below that? And if that is the case, how do you fix that problem? Because it's the government, you know, isn't in charge of every single appointment, is it? It's, it's got to be up to against defence chiefs to fix that. If indeed they agree, there's that problem. Well, Tom... On the government's part, what absolute drooling, illogical nonsense that backgrounding is. If the people at the top are magnificent, but the people just below them are hopeless, who chose the people just below them? The people at the top did. Uh, I mean, this government can't keep its lines straight from, from breakfast to lunchtime in defence. When Richard Miles came into the defence, he said all the problems with defence were the result of the Morrison government and the defence establishment was absolutely fantastic. The military were great, the department was great, everybody was great. After two years of failing to produce anything useful in defence, of no change, of paralysis, of all, of, all the uh, programs stalled, no new money, failure within his own government, he then discovers that all the faults lie with the defence establishment. They no longer lie with the government because now he's the government. But because he's promoted all these people who presided over what he now regards as a very poor culture over the last 10 years, he's then got to say it's actually not them, it's the people just below them. I mean, give me a break. Nobody takes any responsibility here. Miles's first big mistake as minister was to extend the appointment of Angus Campbell and to reappoint Greg Moriarty as the Secretary of the Defence Department. If your message is we need wholesale, huge cultural change, you don't achieve that by reappointing everybody who has presided over the poor culture. And my final question to you, Tom, is if the guys at the top are such mm. geniuses, how come they haven't fixed this problem by now? Well, they're Probably fair enough questions. Not ones that I can answer, Greg, but we always appreciate your thoughts. Uh, we don't Thanks, like Tom. fence sitters. No one would accuse you of that. Greg Sheridan, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.